a text from Janet. Janet yeah. is in the audience and would love to be let in. Okay. We will, we will do that. <clears throat> it looks like Pat is there as well. And Mandy Joe. Mm -hmm. so. Oops. <clears throat> Not allowing me to promote Janet. Tom or Doug, do you have that? Oh, there we go. She finally moved over there. Okay. I made it. I'm eating though, so I'm going to stay off camera. Thank you, Pam. You are welcome. You're welcome. I don't right. see I don't see Karen over there. Right. And I don't see Bruce. <clears throat> Janet, we're going to mute you. Okay. Um but we do have a quorum. Amherst Media is here with us. We are recording. You are a co-host. Mr. Long is also a co-host. Mr. Malloy is a co-host. You're all covered. It's 6.33. I think we're good to go. All right. Thank you, Pam. You're welcome. Here oh, comes Karen. Okay, good. Karen is coming. She's coming. She needed a... <laughs> okay. Sorry. Oh, oh I... my gosh. <laughs> Thank you, Karen. Hi. My computer needs to be updated somehow, and I tried for a half an hour, and it's just, I'll have to figure it out. Sorry. So this okay, is we're good to go. Mm -hmm. Welcome to the Amherst Planning Board meeting of March 1st, 2023. My name is Doug Marshall, and as the chair of the Amherst Planning Board, I am calling this meeting to order at 6.35 p.m. This meeting is being recorded and is available live stream via Amherst Media. Minutes are being taken. Pursuant to Chapter 20 of the Acts of 2021 and extended by Chapter 22 of the Acts of 2022 and extended again by the state legislature on July 16th, 2022, this planning board meeting, including public hearings, will be conducted via remote means using the Zoom platform. The Zoom meeting link is available on the meeting agenda posted on the town website's calendar listing for this meeting or go to the planning board webpage and click on the most recent agenda, which lists the Zoom link at the top of the page. No in-person attendance of the public is permitted. However, every effort will be made to ensure the public can adequately access the meeting in real time via technological means. In the event we are unable to do so, for reasons of economic hardship or despite best efforts, we will post an audio or video recording, transcript, or other comprehensive record of proceedings as soon as possible after the meeting on the Town of Amherst website. Board members, I will take a roll call. When I call your name, unmute yourself, answer affirmatively, and return to mute. Uh, Bruce Coldham. Uh, I do not see Bruce. Tom Long. Present. Andrew McDougall. Present. I, Doug Marshall, am present. Janet McGowan. Here. Johanna Newman. Here. Karen Winter. Here. And uh, Bruce Coldham, I now see you. Yes, I think I'm here. Can you hear me? Yes, we can, and welcome. Good. Um, I should say that uh, power on this island is pretty unreliable. So if I disappear at any point, uh, it's probably because of that. OK. Board members, if technical issues arise, we may need to pause to fix the problem and then continue the meeting. If the discussion needs to pause, it will be noted in the minutes. Please use the raise hand function to ask a question or make a comment. I will see your request and call on you to speak. After speaking, remember to remute yourself. The general public comment item is reserved for public comment regarding items not on tonight's agenda. Please be aware the board will not respond to comments during general public comment period. 
public comment may also be heard at other times during the meeting when deemed appropriate by the planning board chair. Please indicate you wish to make a comment by clicking the raise hand button when public comment is solicited. If you have joined the Zoom meeting using a telephone, please indicate you wish to make a comment by pressing star nine on your phone. When called on, please identify yourself by stating your full name and address and put yourself back into mute when finished speaking. Presidents can express their views for up to three minutes or at the discretion of the planning board chair. If a speaker does not comply with these guidelines or exceeds their allotted time, their participation may be disconnected from the meeting. Okay, so it's now 638 and we'll go right into the first item on our agenda. Um, these are uh, the, uh, approval of the minutes that are available and they the minutes we have for this meeting are from our meeting one month ago on February 1st, 2023. Are there any board members who have comments on the minutes? Tom. There is a spelling error on page, hold on, I gotta find it. Oh boy. Um, I had it open a second ago. It is uh, under new business. So item five, that is page eight. And it says the the board and the is spelled wrong in the second paragraph. That's all I got. <clears throat> all right. So nine pages and one spelling error. Huh? That's a pretty good score. Wait a minute. Where is it? This, which paragraph? It is the uh, um, under new business A. Uh, it's the second paragraph, or the actually the first paragraph. There, it starts oh, the sentence. I see the. Yep. Okay. That's all. Okay. All right. Um, anybody else have any other comments? All right. Uh, anybody want to make a motion to approve with the correction that Tom identified, Johanna? I move to approve as amended or as suggested by Tom. All right, and Andrew, you got your hand up next. Second. Thank you both. Um, and in, any other comments before we vote? All right, we'll go right into the vote. Starting with Bruce, a yes is to approve the minutes. Yes. All right, and Tom? Aye. And Andrew? Aye. And Janet. Aye. All right. And Johanna. Aye. Karen. Aye. And I'm an I as well. I believe that's unanimous. Thank you all. Mm -hmm. All right. Okay. Now we'll go into the public comment period. Uh, as I said before, this is for items for comments on items not on tonight's agenda. And since the only item on our agenda is the proposed zoning amendment, uh, mostly relating to Article 3, this is the time for comments on other topics. Do we have any members of the public who would like to make a comment? All right, That's I do not me. see any hands raised. Maybe I will go ahead and re read the list of names I see in the public as I've been doing uh, lately. First, we have David Zomek. We have Pam. We have uh, Dorothy Pam, Frederick Hartwell, Ira Brick, Jessica Barrington, Joan O'Meara, John Varner, Louise C., single letter, Mandy Jo Haneke, Mara Keen, Melissa Ferris, Pam Rooney, Pat DeAngelis, Rob Crowner, Sandy Muspratt, and Susanna Muspratt. All right, so that's 16 different names. All right, and there are no hands raised yet, so we'll go right on to the third item on our agenda. The time now is 6.42. And the third item is to open a new public hearing. It's this is uh, regarding a zoning bylaw, Article 3, use regulations, and Article 4, development methods, Article 9, non conforming lots, uses, and structures, and Article 12, de definitions. To see if the town will vote 
to amend Article 3 use regulations to change the permitting requirements for owner -occupi occupied duplexes, affordable duplexes, non owner occupied duplexes, converted dwellings, and townhouses to create more streamlined permitting pathway for these uses, to remove the use category subdividable dwellings, to add a use category three family detached dwelling. Uh, and in parentheses, triplex, to add a permitting pathway and standards and conditions for triplexes, to modify standards and conditions for other housing use categories, to amend permitting requirements for housing use categories in the aquifer recharge protection overlay district, to amend article four development methods to add three family dwelling where appropriate, to amend Article 9, non-conforming lots, uses, and structures, to add a reference to three-family dwelling, to amend Article 12, definitions, to add three-family detached dwelling unit triplex, and to delete subdividable dwelling. So, board members, are there any disclosures from board members? I suppose uh, I can, I can, uh, I'm, I'm not uh, reluctant to say I work at UMass and I know there are many people in town who think that UMass cares deeply about how the uh, town uh, either provides or doesn't provide housing. So um, I am just stating that I do work at UMass. And uh, I, to the best of my knowledge, I have no interest in this particular topic from my work. And I believe I can review and vote on this fairly and objectively. All right. Uh, so this is the at least the third, possibly the fourth meeting at which we've discussed this topic, uh, although we are just opening the hearing tonight. So I feel like the board is fairly familiar with the original proposal. And uh, Mandy, Joe, and Pat, um, Maybe you know you could do a quick overview and then tell us has anything changed based on the comments you've heard so far. Um, I know member many members of the public that are on the list I read have been at earlier meetings. Um, uh, I don't want you to shortchange their understanding of what you're doing, but uh, we we have been over this road already a couple of times. So with that, Mandy, Joe, and Pat, welcome. Thank you. Um, <laughs> one of the things that I really would like to say is that one of our primary goals is to create housing that is affordable for a range of incomes and a diversity of residents. And we have a very, very strong belief, uh, as does Strong Towns, which is an ad advocacy group, I'm sorry, supporting incremental change and development. And that goal is that no neighborhood should experience radical change and no neighborhood should be exempt uh, from change. Uh, and by allowing incremental neighborhood growth, we can increase housing access and inclusivity. Um, and I'm gonna do a quick check with Mandy um, because you're asking us not necessarily to uh, do the whole presentation, but um, well, I'll, do, I'll, leave, I'll leave it up to your discretion. Okay, if we start to get too long and boring, just let us know. Um, well, our goals and defining principles are clear, and uh, when that comes up, we'll be able to look at them. And if you could go to the next slide, one is equity in housing by eliminating exclusionary zoning policy and adding more residential uh, dwellings. Uh, and allowing them to be permitted uh, through a smoother, easier process. Uh, it will help eliminate uh, economic and social segregation. We'll be able to create multiple places for home ownership opportunities and neighbors that aren't solely apartments or solely single family homes, but create a mix of housing types. We believe that the changes um, uh, can to multifamily dwellings can improve sustainable uh, land use, is sustainable uh, and and environmental and climate issues, but really make homes easier and cheaper for people to share. 
uh, we want to address the housing uh, crisis because if we don't, we change nothing. Uh, we need to encourage more housing opportunities, uh, both new and infill new, near village centers in downtown. We need to look at the current duplex and converted dwelling and townhouse permit pathways and not encourage building uh, these types as a way of doing nothing. We need to uh, have logic in the use of the table for permitting uh, requirements. A more intense use should not have a less restrictive permitting requirement. And an example, if an apartment has an SPR pathway in a residential zone, then a converted dwelling should not have an S a special permit pathway in the same residential zone. So if you would go to the next slide. Mandy, you wanna take this one quickly? Yep. Um, so this one was just to give us an illustration that in our village centers, which um, the planning board talked about a lot about a week ago at their special meeting and for particular ones for wanting to sort of look at development in those village centers that we really have a wide range of zoning districts that are within a half mile of those village centers. So when we're looking at increasing infill, um, increasing that missing middle of housing, we can't just look at our RG, for example, because well near our village centers are RO, our RLD, our RN, are pretty much every um, residential zoning district we have in town um, where we tend to put residences. And so this was just sort of to give you that visual reminder of when we look at Pomeroy, when we look at Atkins, when we look at North Amherst, when we look at East Amherst, we really do have the full range of residential districts there. And so prohibiting something from being built in a residential district prohibits it from being built near a village center, the very idea of where we want to actually promote more housing. Okay, and next slide. Uh, this is a, I really want people to pay attention to this because there is a um, sense in Amherst that if we build duplexes and triplexes that we're going to have more student renters. Well, yes, they are potential renters, but so are families that are just starting out in our community, young professionals, uh, recent graduates, and friends who want to live near each other, siblings or other family members. Uh, there's also a sense that, um, well, I, I'll go, and potential owners. Who are the potential owners? We're not talking about developers here. We're talking about ordinary people, families just starting out, people who rent out other units for income to survive, to live on, friends who want to live near each other and share and purchase uh, the expense. And this is interesting because this is a, a progression uh, that we're seeing across the nation where younger people are buying uh, with other families and building duplexes or converting uh, current uh, two family homes um, and three family homes and living together more closely. We have family members who wanna live near each other but in separate units. And we have people who need, as we said before, additional income of other units in order to afford to buy a property. It's been kind of amazing in our conversations to see how many small landlords they are and how they cross the spectrum of, people, of people's incomes. Next slide. So what is the purpose of zoning? It deals basically with the use without regard to the ownership of the property involved or uh, who may be the operator of the use. And it's very important to regulate, using zoning to regulate non-land use problems such as behavior, like large gatherings, property upkeep and ownership, that's not appropriate. And it can really have unintended consequences. Owner occupancy rules have several ne negative effects on equity efforts to build multifamily housing and the overall housing supply. Because renters typically have lower incomes than homeowners and are racially more diverse, owner occupancy requirements affect the economic and demographic makeup of neighborhoods. Next slide. <laughs> we're, we're very um, trying to really look at the very real problems of um, student behavior and 
uh, we're really trying to use a multi-pronged approach. Well, property upkeep, parking in undesignated areas, loud noises, gatherings uh, are not exclusive to any demographic or ownership status. But we need to really look at, and this is something else that Mandy and I and other people on uh, uh, CRC are working on, is uh, updating the rental permitting bylaw to address property maintenance. We're looking at the nuisance bylaw to define it more broadly. We want to enforce noise, nuisance, and permitting bylaws, management and parking plans, and waste hauling regulations. We need to seek pilots to help pay for proactive enforcement. Uh, we need to shift conver uh, conversation with UMass and the colleges to assisting their own employees in purchasing homes or renting in Amherst. We need to consider rezoning areas near village and, and centers to expand housing and retail opportunities. And we need to consider the impacts of requirements like parking minimums on who chooses to live in a dwelling. Um, we can avoid these impacts by simply regulating upkeep rather than assume that renters will be bad neighbors. Local officials could enforce housing clothes, codes, blight ordinances, and noise ordinances. Instead, they rely on owner occupancy as a shortcut for regulating maintenance. And that's a quote from the Brookings uh, Institute, which is an important quote. And we'll get to that later. Next slide. Yeah, um, I think I'm doing the next slide, uh, yep. the next couple of slides. Um, but, yes. but you know, you may be asking, why did we talk about the multi-pronged approach? And so I just want to go back to that one a little bit before we get into our proposal. And it's because we're basically asking you to bring an open mind to mm -hmm. our proposal and recognize that um, no one thing can solve the issues we have in Amherst, but if we refuse to do one thing or one proposal because we're, we want to use that type of regulation to address all the issues, we'll never move forward. Um, and so we have to recognize that we need to take that multi-pronged approach and we can't stay in a stasis to solve the problems we have because, um, not everything's happening at once. So I, we're just asking you to keep an open mind. So types of dwellings, we will go through these pretty quickly. Um, you've seen most of these slides before. The duplex one has not changed. We're not proposing a change in duplex. It's two units in one building. Triplex, based on things we heard from you and from multiple other places we've talked to, we are actually proposing a different definition of triplex than we originally did. Um, we originally proposed one that was built up down um, vertically only because the townhomes had three units side by side. We have changed the townhome definition in our newest proposal and what is in front of you today to go to four to 10 units instead of three to 10 units such that a triplex would be any three unit building as long as the three units are in a single building. And so this means it encompasses more than just the vertical. We've gotten rid of the two units have to share entrances. We've gotten rid of they have to be built on top of each other. It is literally, our proposal is now any three unit residential building. Um, and we've made proposal, the proposal now includes the changes to townhomes definitions that would be required to make that possible. Um, and so you see that here in what is a townhouse. Um, the definition says no fewer than three or no more than 10. And so our proposal is to change it to no fewer than four, nor more than 10, such so that triplex includes all those three unit buildings. Uh, converted dwellings, again, we've seen them all. I added some pictures of actual converted dwellings in our town. So you can see what a converted dwelling looks like in Amherst. And again, I just want to focus on converted dwellings are buildings that already exist, that we're trying to move, that, that the owner is proposing to change from a one-unit building or a two-unit building to maybe a three- or a four-unit building or convert a different building on the property that already exists. The middle picture here, um, the converted dwelling is the small, what might have at one point been a garage, but it's the outbuilding um, behind the tree. It was the best Google Maps picture I could get. <laughs> um, so um, the conditions, I believe, um, Pat, you are doing the first yeah. couple. Yeah. Um, you can see that it, 
terms of duplexes, the general requirements are that the exterior, um, exterior appearance and footprint be compatible with single family dwellings. And there's a compliance with zoning article seven and street numbering section 3.204 of the design guidelines do apply and so does dark sky lighting. Um, the, if we go to the next slide, there, this is an important one because we're looking here at owner occupied uh, duplexes that would re, uh, have a deed restriction uh, required and could not then transfer over to non owner occupied affordable duplexes also have that deed restriction and here we see the first real change where we're talking about multiple management plans required and compliance with the rental permitting and application of zoning section 11.24 and a written decision that goes straight through those requirements are also the requirements of the uh, non-owner occupied duplex where we're talking about professional management, that's an addition being required. The others are the same. Uh, and we're talking then for triplexes and triplexes is what Miriam Webster says, but it's uh, anyway, it, again, the same thing, professional management, multiple management uh, plans required compliance with uh, permit rent, rental permitting. And uh, here the with the, uh, triplexes, we're saying there needs to be SOAR connection required and a location requirement. So next slide. Uh, the next one is me. The yep. location requirement um, mirrors the townhouse location requirement in terms of, uh, we had heard you guys, uh, the planning board talk about, well, near major roads and stuff like that. So we didn't put the exact language in the pack in this presentation, but it's in the mm -hmm. packet. Um, and the sewer requirement comes back with the concern about triplexes in some of the outlying areas. Um, design review guidelines. We heard that you guys were all concerned that we had proposed removing them from duplexes and then we did not propose including them in triplexes. And so we've added them back in. But we wanted to talk a little bit about why in some sense we had removed them in the first place. It's not necessarily because design guidelines are, are problematic per se, it's because the design guidelines in our bylaw were written to apply to only the area you see in blue, which includes the BG and the BL, our downtown business district, and the properties immediately adjacent to our town common. So they're mostly, they were written with an eye towards business development, commercial, retail, things like that with pedestrian, lots of pedestrian traffic and all. And so there are parts of the design review guidelines that don't really apply to um, either residential buildings, things like the sign standards don't necessarily apply to residential buildings per se, or typically apply to residential buildings or sections that don't necessarily make sense for a mostly residential area that has large setbacks. Um, I think about things like directional expression. I drove down Southeast Street today and there were many houses uh, that don't have their front door facing the road. And that's not necessarily a bad thing, but when you look at the design guidelines, they talk about directional expression of where does the building face. And so we were concerned that we're trying by putting these or these requirements in for things like this, we're trying to fit in some sense a, a square peg into a round hole. Um, so we would just ask that you review them or, or talk to us about how you modify these or apply these when, when they're not necessarily the, the, uh, appropriate design guidelines to apply. And so we just wanted to spend a little bit of time talking about that in particular. Um, Pat, back to you. No, I thought you were going ahead oh, with that. Oh, I'm I sorry. can do this one. Yeah. Um, this I thought you were doing all the, last the requirements. One. Yep. I'll, I'll do the rest. Um, this is the same as the last one. We're not proposing any changes to what exists currently for the townhouse conditions. Um, converted dwelling. This is the slide that shows us what we're retaining, what we're adding, and what we're modifying. We'll get to what, what has been removed from or what we're proposing to delete. So we're modifying the suitably located in neighborhood where proposed. That part, that language is still there. The 
part we've proposed to remove is what suitable location kind of it's kind of defined in the conditions and our thinking was if we remove that sort of specificity as to what a suitable location is we actually give the planning board or the zba um more flexibility in determining what suitability is for a location and so it becomes less prescript prescriptive and therefore potentially better um to ensure that it is a suitable location because you can you can you know adjust what suitability is um based on changing conditions, it's not set in stone. So one of the things we're adding that is the condition for requiring that the closest eventual use, the conditions for those use shall apply. So um, we've talked about this before, ADU or duplex conditions might apply, it might be the owner occupied duplex conditions, it might be the non owner occupied, it might be the affordable, um, triplex conditions, townhouse apartment conditions, um, things like that would, would be what the conditions would be that you'd be looking at for converted dwelling. And that's important because we are proposing to delete some conditions because they are covered under that new condition that the conditions of the, the most close eventual use apply. And so it's not that we're deleting things like mutual compatibility or exterior changes, you know, or owner, the resident manager, it's because they've been included in those other that eventual use condition we wrote um the we delete the the condition of conversions not permitted in ARP because we're actually proposing to allow conversion converted dwellings in the ARP zone and then the other one we're deleting is the minimum open space requirements um it's not necessary and this next slide shows you why because the dimensional table the minimum open space requirements in currently in converted dwellings are 2000 per unit um and 1000 per unit depending on the residential district you're in um in the RN RO and RLD the RN was 1000 per unit which if you're maxed at four units is 4000 square feet of open space the RO and RLD were 2000 square feet um and if you're maxed at four units that's um 8000 square feet of open space as you will see our dimensional table requires well more than that um because of the maximum lot coverage and the minimum square foot per lot for each unit and so we looked at that and said it's in some sense redundant and doesn't provide any because it's not additional open space as you would see in other there's other tables i think for apartments that have additional open space this one was not worded that way this was just minimum open space well our dimensional table requires it so we don't see it as deleting open space requirements we saw that as um not adding anything to what the dimensional table already requires um Pat, to you. <laughs> okay, we can go to the next slide. Here we've uh, put uh, triplex as a new use category, but it, it would not be allowed in commercial districts. Uh, they are not intended for residential uses. And so there's no pathway that conforms to other or similar residential uses. Um, in the business zoning districts, you can see that we looked at triplexes um, and again said it's not allowed um, in the business general limited and village centers. We are looking at uh, converted uh, dwellings and moving them uh, to a site plan review instead of a special permit. In the townhouses, we were going from special, uh, we're asking for a special permit instead of slight site plan review. Um, converted dwellings use, uh, they're already using an existing uh, structure and they're adding infill density in the areas and that's supported by the master plan. Uh, and it's limited to six total dwelling units. And it's currently uh, site plan review in the BG and site plan re review appropriate elsewhere. Townhouses uh, matches uh, the apartment. Um, we don't really need a, a pathway in general business and encourages mixed use or business uses 
over solely uh, residential uses. Uh, and it matches the mixed use building pathway for more transitional build business areas. And it promotes density in those areas. We can go on to the business zoning districts, business neighborhood. Um, here, we've made revisions to the non-owner occupied duplex site and we've made it site plan review. Um, we're looking at uh, tripl triplexes as site plan review and townhouses as site plan review. Um, so we're uh, also then leaving the converted dwellings as site plan review. And, and we've been listening to what some of the requests have been here. Um, duplexes and mixed use buildings are already site plan review and they promote density in this very limited zone and transitions from business uses to solely residential uses at lower densities. Um, and we are removing subdivided, uh, uh, subdivided dwellings from this situation. Okay, we can go on to residential zoning yep. districts. Just one other thing with this yep. one is you are looking at the sole oh, properties yeah. that are the business neighborhood district in our town um, on this slide. So it's it's got about a, seven properties on it yeah. um, and that's about it. Um, village, this is the village center in general, and this is a picture of all of our RG, our general residential, and all of our RVC in town. This is shows it all. And so the, the resident village center, the RVC, is, is quite limited in some sense into where it's located in town. It's in North Amherst, and it's slightly around um, Pomeroy. Um, and then the RG, as we know, is is sort of surrounds our general business district downtown and works its way close to, um, oh, it, the East Village Center. And there's RVC in the East Village Center um, close to the RG and where Fort River is. Um, so that just shows you these are the only properties we're talking about when we say RG and RVC. Um, this, this plan has, we have not, changed anything from our original plan. So you've seen all of this before, so I'm not going to go over it very much. It's mostly site plan reviews and a couple of yeses in the owner-occupied duplexes and affordable duplexes. Um, we've, we believe these are what is suitable for the, these two areas near our uh, that are solely located near our downtown business district and our village centers. Um, I think this is to talk about the RN. You do this slide and I'll do the next ones. Okay, uh, what right here, what you're looking at is are some of the areas in Amherst uh, that are um, RN neighborhood residents and their Echo Hill portions of Amherst Woods. And this is important because people keep thinking that's an exclusive area. Um, they're Cushman Village, Colonial Village. So you see some of the larger uh, apartment complexes um, uh, also. And so this becomes a very important area um, for uh, increasing uh, variety and uh, kinds of housing uh, to to make the neighborhoods more exclusive and also to avoid necessarily building more apartment complexes where uh, <laughs> uh, so that we have neighborhoods that are segregated again economically and socially. So. And so, so what are we proposing here? Um, I'm going to take you back to your conversation last Tuesday, where you talked about those apartment complexes. Well, they're in this zone, right? And right now, you can't build more apartment complexes in that unless you either rezone those areas or you change the use table. Um, sort of what we're trying to do. And so, one of the things you also can't build in that area is townhomes. And so, you know, we've talked about, well, you could go, you you talked about a week ago, well, you could go up maybe to a three-story apartment complex. Well, you could also build townhomes if you if if you change the zoning like we've done in those same areas. Um, it doesn't have to just be apartment complexes or single family homes in these neighborhoods. We're trying to build that middle between single family homes and apartments. So what has changed from our original proposal? What is in green? So for this one, what is in green? We've we've proposed different changes for the aquifer recharge protection district mostly. So you see in townhouse, it just says special permit originally uh, only. 
um, our original proposal had that townhouses would not be allowed in the ARP, and we've changed that to a special permit for the ARP in townhouses too. Um, converted dwellings have not changed from the original proposal. Triplexes and non-owner occupied duplexes we had originally proposed as site plan review in the ARP, and so we are proposing them to be special permit in the ARP instead of site plan review, but site plan review in non-ARP zones. And as you've seen, the RN is mostly non-ARP. And so in that sense, the, our proposal hasn't really changed much from the original proposal for the RN. But again, just keep in mind, this is a district that neighbors village centers that has many apartment complexes already. And so we're trying to add the ability to build stuff other than apartment complexes and um, single family homes here. Um, I think I'm doing this one. So yes, in the are. RO and RLD, um, this is most of the rest of the town we haven't talked about, but what does that include? That includes the rest of Amherst Woods. It includes um, south down to the Holst Road neighborhood. It includes north up to um, the Overlook Jive neighbor neighborhood and some of those areas too. And what are we trying to do? Right now, you cannot build a townhouse there. Right now, um, you need a special permit to build an owner-occupied duplex. Um, right now, you need a special permit to build a non-owner-occupied duplex. And triplexes, since they're not a use category, right now you cannot put them in the RO and RLD zones because they are considered townhouses and apartments. So what are we proposing? We're proposing to allow triplexes by site plan review in this area. We're proposing to allow owner-occupied duplexes um, through the building commissioner and affordable duplexes through the building commissioner and non-owner-occupied duplexes in site plan review. And then converted dwellings and townhouses, we're proposing to allow townhouses through special permit and converted dwellings through special permit. They're currently allowed by special permit. It's the, the aquifer recharge area that is causing that green um, line our original proposal had. Um, an, uh, I'm not actually sure what the original proposal had, but the green shows changes from the original proposal. Um, other revisions, this is Pat. <laughs> so I think these are kind of self-explanatory. Section 4.3, 4 cluster development. We've added triplexes to the uses that are permitted. And we've added triplexes to common land calculation requirements, section 4.4, plan unit residential development, adding triplexes that, um, to the uses that are permitted and adding triplexes to density and intensity of use requirements. Section 4.5, open space community development, we're adding triplexes to the uses, uses that are permitted. And section 9.1, non-conforming lots and add triplexes to the uses that can be constructed on non-conforming lots. Um, we have removed the definition of a sustainable dwelling. Uh, we've expanded, um, we've looked at- Subdividable dwelling. I'm sorry, subdividable, sub thank you. Subdividable, not sustainable. Yes, yes. <laughs> I hate to re uh, remove sustainability, thank you, Joe. So we're removing the subdividable dwelling and 12.51, um, we're adding three family detached dwelling unit or triplex as a single residential building containing three dwelling units. And then moving in 12.52 townhouses, we're cha changing the three to four. Okay. So the ARP, again, we'll talk about what it is. So this includes most of southeast Amherst, I would say. Um, it's to protect the aquifers. And so we've talked about this and we tried to listen um, with concerns about development in those areas. So we've actually pulled back on our proposal it, for non-owner occupied duplexes and triplexes where we had originally proposed site plan review in those areas. And we are now proposing special permit while still maintaining a proposal of site plan review for owner occupied duplexes and affordable duplexes. Um, converted dwellings, we've pulled back and actually proposed no changes. Um, well, we haven't pulled back. We're proposing special permit, which was our original right. proposal there. Sorry, the green is what we've changed since our original proposal. The red is all of the changes. And for townhouses, we originally had not proposed a change. 
Um, so we had originally proposed to keep them no, but uh, after hearing some concern that that was a little bit exclusive, um, we are now proposing that we allow them by special permit in the ARP. Um, this means it's still discretionary. We have required in all of these sections that sewer connections are required because that to us is one of the most important things you need in this district for uh, multifamily housing. Um, the one thing I want to point out that hostels are currently allowed by special permit in this district in the ARP. Um, and we're not trying to change that, but a hostel can have 20 beds, um, up to 20 beds. I don't know um, what the ZBA might uh, allow or permit or allow as a special permit for a hostel, but the current zoning definition is 20 bed max, which is the equivalent of five units or so if they all have four bedrooms, um, which fits within the townhouse size. Um, that doesn't necessarily mean the ZBA would allow or permit, allow a permit with something bigger, but that gives you an idea about triplexes, converted dwellings that can't go above four units, sort of fit within that number of beds that hostels are allowed by special permit within this district already. Um, so that is our ARP proposal. And Pat, and we're getting rid of subdividable dwellings because the build, building commissioner recommends deleting it. It has only been used once since adoption. It applies to new construction only. And um, so we're going to delete both in the use table and in definitions. Yep. And we're open to your questions. I, I would like to say one more thing before we get to questions, because I didn't do much of the initial reasons behind this. We, we've heard a lot about how um, bold this present this proposal is. Um, but when you look at the actual proposed changes, we're really requesting an incremental change in these districts for the permitting of duplexes, triplexes, and converted dwellings and townhomes one pathway easier almost. There are a few areas, particularly with duplexes, that we have requested a move of two. Um, pathways, um, particularly with owner-occupied duplexes. But in general, we're seeking an in incremental change for this missing middle. And so while it is a lot um, and it is comprehensive, it is could be seen as an incremental change to uh, potentially allow a, uh, a allow buildings to be built that we want to be built that are having problems coming to the boards for building. We're not seeing the applications as much as we may want to address the housing issues we are having in town. And so it's it's in in our mind, it's not radical. It is comprehensive. We, as Pat st stated, to start with, we're not trying to affect one area of town. One area of town should not bear the brunt of any of our zoning issues. And so that's why we have made it so, as you, as some people might say, large. Because if we do one at a time or one use at a time or one zone at a time, we really are asking just one area of town to bear the brunt of our changes. And here we're asking the whole town to move incrementally to one um, one permit pathway easier, basically. Thank, Thank you. you. All right. Thank you, Mandy, Joe, and Pat. Um, Chris, uh, I know you had wanted to make some comments, um, and I'm wondering whether this would be the time to do that, or did you, do you still want to do that? I think I would like to do that if, um, yeah, and, and my comments are rather extensive, but I'll try to get through them quickly. And if anybody wants a copy of them, I'll be happy to um, make that available. Um, so shall I start, Doug? Yeah, I guess uh, depending on how long you're gonna go, I think I will just tell everyone on this, on this meeting that I need to leave and uh, attend to a personal obligation at uh, just about 7.30. So uh, if you go longer than that, uh, I will be disappearing and turning the meeting uh, management over to Tom. Um, I personally hope that the board will hear the 
the comments tonight and start deliberation and continue the meeting to March 15th to our next meeting so that I can rejoin the conversation. So with that, uh, Chris, why don't you go ahead? Thank you. Um, good evening. I'm Christine Brestrup, Planning Director, and I'd like to offer a few thoughts about the proposed zoning amendments and what the Planning Department staff has been discussing as we have reviewed the proposal. And by the Planning Department staff, I include Nathaniel Malloy and Rob Mora, Building Commissioner. This statement is incomplete and represents just a portion of what we have discussed. Um, I have five main points that I'd like to uh, make. Um, the first is that um, the proposal does not currently have the robust support of the planning department. Um, the planning department has endeavored to take a neutral stance on this zoning amendment and to spend time learning about it, understanding it, and thinking about its ramifications and how it would work and whether it would accomplish the goals set forth by the proponents. And at this time, we feel that we're not ready to recommend this proposal to the planning board. It is currently too all-encompassing and too complicated, and the consequences and ramifications have not been clearly identified. Um, number two, I have five points. I think I mentioned that. And number two is we believe the proposal is unlikely to accomplish what the proponents set out to accomplish, which is to make home ownership and rental units available to lower and moderate income individuals and families. The planning department believes that the goals of the proponents are worthy and that the town should work to accomplish these goals. However, we believe that the zoning amendment taken in its entirety is not the right mechanism for accomplishing these goals. After many hours of discussion, we have not become clear, we have not come to a con clear conclusion that this proposal will help the town reach the goals that, they've been, that have been set forth by the proponents. And here are some examples of things about which we have concerns, and this is not a complete list. One example is that there's a disconnect between the proposal and the goals to be found in the proposal on owner-occupied duplexes. The proposal to make owner-occupied duplexes by a by-right use in all residential zoning districts on the face of it seems to make sense. However, an investor or developer could purchase a property, build a duplex, which is permitted as an owner-occupied duplex, i.e. by a building permit, live in it for a short time, and then apply to have it changed to a non-owner-occupied duplex. If there were no proposed exterior changes, the non-owner-occupied duplex could then be permitted by administrative approval by the building commissioner with a site plan review waiver. And thereby, the, non -owner, the new non-owner-occupied duplex could be created without any public hearing or public input and without conditions being set forth that would protect abutting properties from potential problems. Um, we need to take time to establish standards, criteria, and conditions for duplexes and figure out how to monitor and maintain owner occupancy when it is required and how to monitor changes in ownership and occupancy. This is just one example of unintended consequences of the zoning proposal. Um, another one is allowing triplexes in the RLD zoning district is another example that may not have the desired effect of providing housing for low and moderate income in individuals and families. In order to permit a duplex in the RLD zoning district, you would need 100,000 square feet of property to meet the lot area requirements, which is two point, roughly two and a quarter acres. It seems unlikely that someone with a property that large would build a triplex and, but, would more likely subdivide the property into two frontage lots and sell the lots for a single family development for large expensive houses. In the RL, in the RO zoning district, you would need 50,000 square feet or 1.15 acres to build a triplex. Um, so we asked ourselves the question, would someone with a property that large want to build a triplex and rent it out, or would they sell the property to be developed for an expensive single family home? Again, it's doubtful that this change would have the desired effect of providing housing for low and moderate income individuals and families. In addition, in the RO and RLD zoning districts, these tend to be located in areas that are not well served by public transportation or other types of services such as stores. So these zoning districts are not ideal locations for multifamily dwellings such as triplexes, especially for people and families who may not have multiple cars per household. Another concern 
uh, issue of concern is the unlikelihood that low and moderate income individuals and families can or will take advantage of the proposed streamlined permitting process due to the expense of buying property and building a house. In the opinion of the planning department, it is unlikely that middle and low income individuals and families will be able to afford to purchase property in Amherst and build an owner occupied duplex. Without a stellar credit rating and history of having previously developed and managed property, a bank is unlikely to make a loan for such a project. The only people or, who, or entities who will be able to get a loan to build this type of development are investors and high income individuals and families who are unlikely to want to live in a duplex. However, if they did take on this type of project, they would be likely to want to get the highest rent possible for the adjacent or second unit, rather than renting it out to a low or moderate income individual or family, although they could do that for altruistic reasons, but we believe that that is unlikely. Amherst recently adopted a zoning amendment that allows ADUs to be permitted by right in most situations. We should see how this new ADU bylaw plays out over time and what the issues are in enforcing the owner occupancy requirement, as well as other aspects of the new ADU bylaw. Let's take time to review how the new ADU bylaw has worked before we launch into a full-blown zoning amendment that would treat other types of uses the way we're treating ADUs. Let's find out how many people have taken advantage of the new ADU bylaw how it is being enforced, and what the results have been for ADUs. And this may give us some insight <clears throat> into how other zoning amendments would play out. The third point I wanted to make is this proposal appears to run counter to the master plan in that it would encourage development of properties outside of the downtown and the village centers and outside of already developed areas. The master plan encourages growth and density in the downtown and village centers and in already developed parts of town and encourages preservation of outlying areas. This proposal would encourage scattered small developments throughout town, including in parts of town that we have worked long and hard to preserve, such as the Bay Road area and other rural parts of town. Development should be focused in areas that are already developed and we should promote infill in these areas. Aspects of this proposal do that, but as a whole, the proposal does not protect our outlying areas and does not focus development in downtown and village centers where the master plan says that development should go. My fourth point is that Amherst does not like other towns that have done away with single family zoning, and I know there are a number of them throughout the nation. Um, more than half of our residents are students, and there's a tremendous pressure on our housing stock to be occupied by students. Amherst has a student population that exceeds their year-round population, and we cannot assume that new dwelling units created through this zoning amendment will be occupied by permanent residents and their families. It is more likely that investors will take advantage of the zoning amendments to create housing that will be occupied by students. As we know, students and developers of housing for students can outbid and outpay middle and low-income families and individuals. The planning department believes that the new units that will be created by the proposed zoning amendment will be occupied primarily by students and owned by investors and developers. We should carefully plan for locations for housing for student populations and place conditions on such housing that make it likely that the units will be managed and maintained to the advantage of the neighbors and the town. And we should be creative in allowing and encouraging housing for low and moderate income individuals and homeowners, such as the project that is being proposed by the Valley Community Development Corporation on Ball Lane in North Amherst, which will be reviewed by the Zoning Board of Appeals in the near future. This type of project will be subsidized by the state and the cost of the land will be lower per unit because the developer can take advantage of Chapter 40B, which allows the Zoning Board of Appeals to approve more units per lot than would ordinarily be allowed by our current zoning. Loosening permitting processes for so many use categories in so many areas all at once will produce a flood of proposals by investors and developers and is unlikely to result in owner-occupied homes being built for, by and for, moderate and low-income individuals and families as envisioned by the proponents. My last point is there are aspects of this zoning amendment which have merits and which could be developed into a workable set of proposals. But as a whole, as it currently stands, it's too broad and all-encompassing to have a positive impact on housing in Amherst. 
Some of the aspects that we found to have merit were making owner occupied duplexes by right in all residential zoning districts. Um, if we couple it with making non owner occupied duplexes by special permit in all residential zoning districts, this would prevent the conversion of owner occupied duplexes to non owner occupied duplexes without a public hearing and without conditions. We should also create a list of standards and conditions for owner occupied duplexes and non owner occupied duplexes, just as we did for ADUs to make sure that these properties are managed and maintained properly. Another um, proposal that we felt had merit was creating the new use category of triplexes, separating three unit buildings from apartment use, from the apartment use category and now separating it from the townhouse category. That makes sense, and these types of uses may be permitted in a similar manner as duplexes. In, in, in other words, owner-occupied and non-owner-occupied. Again, we should establish criteria and conditions to make sure that they are well managed. We also think that eliminating the category of subdividable dwellings is a good idea. This category has only been used once since it was established two decades ago. There may be more aspects of the zoning amendment that should be pursued with the proper criteria and conditions worked out for each and the unintended consequences recognized and mechanisms put in place to avoid them to the extent possible. So I have just presented a few pieces of the proposal that, could, that should be moved forward. And the planning department is ready and willing within our time constraints to work with the proponents to further develop these parts of the proposal. The planning department recommends slowing down, proceeding with caution, and examining how each of the proposed changes will play out. We do not recommend adopting the proposal wholesale in its current form. We recommend against making hopeful assumptions about the outcome without carefully studying the potential pitfalls. We do recommend moving forward with the more promising aspects of the proposal, and we look forward to working with the proponents to do so. Thank you. Thank you, Chris. Um, I will open it up to Mandy, Joe, and Pat, if you guys would like to respond to that before we open up to board questions. One, thank you, Chris. And uh, it's, a lot of that was difficult to hear. Um, but I also wanna say uh, that the kind of developer who builds a triplex or converts an existing a uh, single family home into one is not necessarily the kind of developer who is going to do massive uh, building and massive rents. Um, there, 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 it a lot uh, depends on the, on the work of cultivating an ecosystem of incremental developers in town, uh, small developers, small landlords, uh, uh, small owners, and therefore landlords. Um, and we need the zoning to uh, support that work. The other piece, uh, there, there are changes in Amherst and nationally that support the kind of incremental growth that we're asking for in all areas. And that includes the fact that population growth has slowed, household sizes are decreasing, and there is an increase nationally uh, in single person households. In addition, people are choosing to build progressively smaller homes because they are less ex uh, expensive and more sustainable and have the potential to fill the starter home gap. Uh, I'm gonna use my son as an example. Uh, he and his wife have uh, joined with uh, another family that has a young child and they have been looking for two family homes to buy uh, so that because it's cheaper, they can afford that the combined incomes of both families would make it possible for them to be homeowners. Mm -hmm. uh, this, you know, I've used the example before of friends of mine in Pelham who have developed uh, and lived in a duplex in Pelham and raised their children there and are aging in place there. So it is not what we're, what the potential is here. And the potential is to expand who can purchase something in Amherst, because you can buy a single family help home with support from other family members who want to live with you or friends um, who, who want to um, live and work with you. Um, so I think that 
I think that we're afraid in Amherst of, of changes, but not making changes is not going to uh, benefit the community. And I appreciate your willingness to work on parts of this with, uh, with us, and we will take you up on that. Uh, but I, I really think that we need to open our minds in Amherst about what's the potential here for changing and infilling in small ways that make housing affordable to firefighters, uh, you know, uh, <laughs> low income people, moderate income people. I don't know. Mandy, you'll be more articulate. Uh, I'm not sure I'll be much more articulate. Um... Yeah, I, I want to thank Chris for her very thoughtful statement um, and concerns and all. And as with Pat, I look forward to working with the planning staff um, to mm -hmm. see if we can um, reach a compromise that the planning staff can get behind. Um, you know, that we, I, I would really like to be able to do that. Um, I, I need more time, obviously, to digest what what Chris just said, but some things struck me. Um, you know, runs counter to the master plan because it encourages property development outside the downtown and village centers, um, except the Pomeroy Village Center includes the RO area. It includes the RD area, RLD area. And so um, how do we encourage development in the Pomeroy Village Center if we refuse to add the, these uses to the RO and RLD, you know, so those are sort of the questions that we as Pat, Pat and I talked about as we proposed this right and so those are some of the questions I would come back with in terms of uh, maybe your solution is a village center overlay I don't know right. <laughs> yeah. But um, maybe the solution mm -hmm. is to change those areas from RO or RLD zoning to an RVC zoning, right? Yeah, and I'm I'm not sure. I think we would support some of that, right? And and starting those conversations, you know, let's continue those types of thinking and conversations. Um, I'd love to hear what conditions you think we're missing because we tried to base our conditions off of um, the um, the the ADU conditions, um, you know, and so. Talking, I think there's just a lot of talking that needs to go on because we looked at the ADU conditions for our duplex and triplex conditions um, and things like that. And then, you know, how, how do we respond to, well, they might not have the intended effect because the lots are large and they might just be subdivided into single family homes. Well, if you're not concerned that triplexes will be built in the RLD because they just divide the lot, I guess my response is what's the harm in allowing triplexes in the RLD then, <laughs> right? Um, and seeing which way they go, right? I think that goes back to Pat's concern about we're afraid, right? Well, it's mm -hmm. not gonna be used that way, it would be used this way, so let's not even try it. And, and I think one of the things we're asking you as the planning board to think about is let's try some of this, right? Let's not continue to be afraid to do anything because we don't know exactly what will happen mm -hmm. um let's try some stuff and and see can i just jump in real quick chris you um had listed smaller proposals and things that you would you're willing to work um going forward i i noted um obviously triplexes was something you wanted to add and then deleting the subdividable category what were, were there other things on that list just so that in case they become part of discussion that we want to talk about today of the smaller proposals you want to continue, you would continue forward. I did say that we would can, uh, be interested in looking at the owner occupied duplexes by right. Okay. Um, but with the caveat that we would make um, non owner occupied duplexes by special permit so that there wouldn't be that danger of them of owner occupied duplexes becoming yeah. non owner occupied kind of by accident. Um, you know, we have right. to think about all those permutations. And Rob Mora and Nate Malloy and I have been having conversations mm -hmm. about, you know, well, if we do this, what will happen? What's going to happen down the road? And how can we put a, a stopgap in place that will prevent that 
negative thing from happening while allowing the good thing to happen. So there may be more aspects of this proposal that I think are a good idea. I've actually been thinking about this whole um, proposal ever since it was ever since it came to our attention and I didn't know how to react to it. It was so big. I didn't know how to respond. And so this morning I just started writing my brains out and you know, thank you. This is what I came up with. So yeah. it isn't a complete thought, and there's more to be said, but it's the best I could do yeah. for this time. Thank you, Chris. Um, so I guess I'll open it up to questions or comments from the board. I'm not sure if you guys have specific questions for Mandy, Joe, and Pat. We can start there. I see Janet. So um, I, have, I have a lot of things to say, but I'm going to limit it. I think this is a good proposal to start a dialogue that we re need to have. We all agree on the problem. We all have the common goal. Like, how do you make space in Amherst for, um, you know, low, moderate, you know, income families? How do you make it? How can people enter a marketplace that is just, you know, housing prices have gone up everywhere. They've gone up in our town rental prices are through the roof, not necessarily because of a national housing crisis, because we have too many students that aren't living on UMass campus. It's just thousands of students have been admitted to UMass over 20 years, and they've built 1,500 or 1,400 units, and they're adding 400 more. And that demand, you know, any anything that we look at, we have to look at other college towns grappling with these issues, because we're not going to solve it just by allowing more housing. Mm -hmm. We've had over 50 1,500 housing units built in Amherst, we're in a boom, but prices are going up because we can now charge $2,000 for 450 square feet to a student. And so I think, um, but we need to figure out like, how do we work with the situation we have? Um, so, I, so I think what we need in our zoning bylaw, like I appreciate the idea of like things being treated like some more clarity, some more um, simplification of our zoning bylaw more consistency. Um, I, I think we should have the same design standards for all housing. You know, it all should fit in, it all should look good. It all should be in a relationship to what's around it. Um, I think what I, I have two kind of issues, like major issue is we already allowed multifamily housing in a rezoning district. We already allow fourplexes, um, but we call them converted dwellings. We allow triplexes, they're called subdividable dwellings. We allow a house with a duplex in the backyard. We allow seven units of housing on an acre in RG. In my RN, I could build two more units on my property, which is three quarters of an acre. We're already there. The question is, why aren't people doing more of that? And I think that's the nut that we have to crack. And I don't think it's because people feel nervous going to the ZBA. You know, if you go to the ZBA and if you go to the planning board, it's the same process. You still have to file notice. You have to pay us some, you know, I don't know if it's $300 fee. You're going to wind up seeing us three, probably two or three times, sometimes five times in the planning board, depending on the questions we have, how well put together the application is. Yeah, applications go faster with an attorney or a really good architect who knows the process. That's the same thing that happens in front of the ZBA. We're really kind of parallel tracks. The ZBA has a little bit more power to say no because um, they can be a little more outward looking in the neighborhood. I don't think we want to lose that in a college town. And so I don't know that, that the process of going to the ZBA is stopping multifamily housing. And so fixing that, I don't think does anything. It just moves you know, a process that involves money, preparation, architects, you know, a stormwater management plan, whatever, all the things that we require, it just moves it from ZBA to us. So I think that, you know, but I, all these kind of changes and the intricacies in them are really hard to follow, but it has made me sit down and say like, oh, what would I do? And maybe we don't call it subdividable dwelling and maybe we don't have so many like strange little quirks between converted subdividable but also adding a two triplex when you already can have a triplex in these two different ways doesn't make sense to me. So I think, you know, there's some kind of simplicity and clarity that we need to bring to the bylaw so we all understand that we already have triplexes. We don't need to add the category. Um, 
anyway, so that that's just my my first thoughts. Thank you. Thank you. Andrew. Thanks, Tom. Um, to, uh, you know, again, an, an incredibly thought provoking presentation, as well as, you know, Chris, I think your your comments equally um, thought provoking. I, I, um, I don't want to pile on echo a lot of what was said. It's really, really big. And it's really hard to kind of wrap around arms around it. I do want to point out things that I did like, though, right? That um, you know, eliminating the subdivided or the the subdivided. Sorry for <laughs> wrote some notes here, but um, they're a little little um, uh, unclear to read. I think rules, you know, getting more residential around village centers, great, right? I think the willingness to look more closely at the aquifer recharge protection. Um, because of advancements in, in um, sewer access, I think that's I think that's great to, to be more willing to look at that. I love the simplicity and definitions. You know, single family, duplex, triplex, townhome, apartment. Like that is something that I think is really easy to understand, and and it's something I would be in, in supportive of. Um, I also really like this notion that. Um, <clears throat> Mixing housing types will increase diversity. Now you brought that up early on, and um, I think that's something that is worth a lot of thought and consideration. Um, but I will, um, I will just sort of again finish it with. Uh, there's a lot here. It's hard to get kind of our arms around in its um, entirety. Um, but happy to hear Chris say that she is. She is willing to move, you know, use planning department resources mm -hmm. to help us uh, um, tackle some of these because it's it really is, um, I think, a great mm -hmm. conversation starter. I think there there are really some very positive things here, and I hope that we can leverage some of the enthusiasm and the call to action and actually like mm -hmm. move towards action because I, that is that is something that we need to do. Thanks. Okay. Thank you, Andrew. Um, and, and I do think, um, you know, we had a pretty robust discussion um, last week, which hopefully you guys were able to listen to you and, and you obviously responded to and, and that had to do with village centers. And I do wonder if something that, um, you know, we're going to discuss in the future would be an overlay district that allows these kind of uses in the way that you're describing them, but only within certain, you know, um, distances around those particular areas as maybe a case study or something to that matter. So um, so I do think we're considering those things, even if um, we don't want to deploy them universally, but I think we can put them on a plate for discussion um, in some of these zones as well um, when we talk more about our overlays and whatnot. Um, other questions from the board? Comments? How do I do that? Johanna? Thanks, Tom, and thanks, Pat and Mandy Joe, and thank you, Chris. Um, it, you know, um, there is housing being built in Amherst now, so I want to give a nod to Janet's point. I wouldn't call it a boom, though, because we have such a huge deficit from years of not building housing in town that you know, we are not out of the hole yet. And um, and so I do think we need to be thinking really hard and thoughtfully about how we generate housing in this town, how we deal with our student population while achieving, you know, our climate goals and the goals of the master plan. And I think I, I do kind of take issue with this idea that like it has to be a town-wide approach and that increasing density throughout the entire entire town by making the permit pathway easier through the entire town for certain types of housing stock might not be the right approach because um while i understand maybe the justice arguments for one area of town not quote bearing the brunt of zoning issues as a town, we have decided that the places where we want to see denser development 
is our downtown and in our village center. And that's where the focus should be. And so I'm really interested in how do we do more of that steer development to those places, which then, you know, helps with our climate goals and our, you know, kind of livable, walkable, bikeable communities and doesn't encourage sprawl. Um, so that's one piece to me that feels important. And then, you know, I feel like if there's one person in town who lives and breathes the goals of the master plan, it's Chris Breastrup. And so when she says, don't make hopeful assumptions without examining the pitfalls, um, that mm -hmm. carries a lot of weight with me. And I, you know, if just very, you know, kind of off the cuff, Chris is able to say, well, here's one pitfall that I'm concerned about, you know, based on my experience and here's another, and here's another, um, I think we do need to explore those and give them um, I don't know, I guess the, the breathing room to, to be explored before charging in. Thank you, Johanna. Um, I have Karen next. Uh, struggling with, uh, it's not my, yeah, so thank you for, uh, Chris, I, so, uh, so the details that you have. Seen. We're having a bit of trouble hearing you, Karen. We're getting an <laughs> echo. I'm not sure if it's. She may need to mic. turn off the other computer. Did I turn it off? Can you hear me now? Yeah, I think we're still getting an echo, though. Okay, Pam, we, we, we couldn't hear you, Pam. Yeah, I was muted. Well. Karen, you're muted now. Karen, you're here twice. So maybe if yeah. you eliminate yeah. one of your right. um, images and just have one um, presence here, that could help. Can hear you. All right, I'll, I'll go to Janet um, and then we can come back to you, Karen, if we um, we'll give it a try in a few minutes. Karen, I wonder if you could call in too. We could just hear you that way because that's the most important thing. I just want to say very quickly that most, you know, not completely, but mostly the RO and RLD, outlying rural and um, and residential, but outlying residential and, and rural density. If you look at the map, they're mostly farmlands um, and wetlands and resource areas. And so, there is, you know, and so it also we see some very large homes moving into that area too. But these are like, you know, Amherst's prime soil, soils of statewide interest or importance. And, you know, it's where we're getting a lot of our food and increasingly getting more and more food. So I, I think it's not an elitist thing to say, oh, we should protect these. It's part of our strategy for climate change. It's part of it for a sustainable food system. And so I think those lands need to get protected. They are often right next to wetlands and wildlife habitat and wetlands are uptaking tremendous amounts of carbon as are you know, our fallow fields and, you know, or hay fields and things like that. So I don't, I, I do really support the master plan goal of directing density towards already you know, developed areas. Thank you, Janet. Um, I think we've heard that quite a few times. So I think that's something we wanna consider um, as we move forward, um, we have any other comments? Does Karen want to try to come back? Bruce, any comments before we move on? No. Um, we have a, a large collection of attendees. I'm guessing um, we're going to want to hear some public comment today. Um, we are approaching the eight o'clock mark, so maybe we should take our five minute eight o'clock break now and come back for public comment, if that makes sense for everybody. Okay, so I have 756. Um, why don't we come back uh, 802 by the time you guys get out of here. 802, thank you. So turn off your cameras and mute, and we'll see you back here soon.
<clears throat> All right, it's 8.02, and I see most people are coming back, but I'm still waiting on Andrew, Johanna, and Bruce. <clears throat> And Karen. Where's the stand in? That's for the Emma. Um, I'm just gonna quickly turn off my camera while I finish eating dinner. I'm sure, no problem. Thanks, me, uh, I me too. <clears throat> Um, okay, welcome back, everybody. It's eight oh two. I think we're still waiting on Bruce. Um, and I think before we go to public comment, um, let's see if Karen would like to follow up on her comments. Karen, do you want to unmute? Yeah. Okay, let's see if I can do this. You sound great. Um, yeah. yeah, sorry for all this confusion. I have to go to the Apple store tomorrow. But um, Chris, the comments that you made were so specific. And I must say that I, um, I echo everything. When you keep saying, uh, Mandy, Joe, and Pat, that we have to get over our fear, you know, you can call it fear or you can call it caution. You can look at one specific area and uh, look at what could possibly be a really catastrophic effect on a neighborhood. And that's what we have to be very careful. That's There's a lot of responsibility to neighbors, to, to a whole town in, uh, in lifting restrictions. And I do agree, all of us want, I, I applaud you because all of us want a kind of an infill and a possibilities. I have children that want to be able to live in Amherst and can't afford these big single family homes. So I understand what you're talking about. But the reason why we say go incrementally is because uh, we, we have a very special town as we keep talking about with this amazing quantity of students right there. Uh, and developers that are so eager to be able to milk these opportunities that what we want to create these middle family possibilities. And I, I like that. I mean, I know that it's very nice to live closer to people, to share homes. That's what young people are doing. We need to go in that direction, but we have to be cautious. And uh, Chris, the way that you want to address this with the town to go talk about the possibilities that you see with your experience um, as something to work on and work in that way. I really applaud that. So thank you. Thank you, Karen. Um, and if there's no other comments from uh, the board, we can go to public comment um, on this particular topic. Karen, do you, mm -hmm. I'll mute you. Um, so if you have, if you're in the audience and you'd like to give us a public comment, please raise your hand and we'll go through them. You'll have three minutes uh, each. So can we get, uh, Pam's got already ahead of me. Um, and uh, remember to give us your uh, name and address in Amherst um, prior to your comments. And we will start with Melissa Ferris, who's had her hand up for quite some time. So Pam, can we bring over Melissa? Hi, uh, I'm Melissa Ferris. I'm here with my husband, Graham Caldwell. We're at 285 Lincoln Avenue, um, in the RG district, for those who don't know that offhand. Um, and uh, we read through the, the proposal very carefully. Um, and we we had some questions and obviously some concerns. Um, one of the questions is, uh, what would your proposals be for the historic district, where generally speaking, there's a design component to the um, the building plans, uh, and that is a large part, I think, of part of the special permitting process uh, that you're trying to wipe out. So we we'd like to know if you consider that. Um, 
you know, to be uh, something that you would you would uh, be looking at in the site plan review and how it would be reviewed now as opposed to how it had been done before. Um, we we do think that in terms of uh, where people would want to develop, it's it's obviously in the town centers, as uh, one of the board members said, in, in terms of bearing the brunt, it's where the public transport is, it's where the restaurants are, it's where you know, there's a walkable city life. So of course that development is gonna center in the RG zones and also gonna center around the university. Um, I, I don't know where the data came from on your slide that suggested that these potential duplexes and townhomes would be occupied by families. I don't know if you can cite where you, where you got that information, but I, I think that for the amount of rents that we were seeing in the town, they can really only be afforded by the students. And I don't think that it's reasonable to expect families to want to live in the same apartment building as a number of apartments that are occupied by groups of students. I just don't think it's it's for like noise reasons it's going to even happen. And then I guess my other question is, why would you not fix the regulations around the housing issues that exist before changing the zoning? Um, you're saying that, you know, oh, at some point we should update the, the sound issues and at some point we should update the maintenance issues and at some point we should update the parking issues. But why wouldn't you change that before you change the zoning? Because obviously those are all going to be deeply impacted by any kind of development that is made based on the zoning changes. And to assume that it's going to happen later after the buildings are built and the people are living in them seems like a, you know, big leap of faith that those of us who live around here probably don't really want to take. And now I'm almost out of time, so thank you. I do want to say, though, that I really applaud the idea of bringing in a mix of incomes into the neighborhood. Um, Graham and I moved here from New York, and we think that it would be wonderful to see more of that. Thank you, Melissa. Um, and it looks like we have Janet Keller, who's next on my list. Can we bring Janet over, please? Jenny, can I meet yourself? Thank you. Um, I would also like to offer my um, appreciation of the tremendous effort and um, the desire to make more housing available. Um, and uh, but and I would like to also give tremendous support to uh, the more targeted approach that Chris um, is uh, uh, offering to work on um, and the detailed, more detailed approach based on the master plan and the resources that are uh, to be protected so that we all may have the use of them. Um, wet wetlands and aquifers and floodplains, um, for example, uh, are uh, cheek by jowl with farmland, both active and fallow um, in these areas. And it all works together as a complex system that um, is very vulnerable to any development. I can't imagine um, if, we, for example, had to start using the aquifers up here in North Amherst for drinking water that we'd be comfortable with just a little bit of sewage in them. Um, so, uh, and we need them for the flood services they provide um, and um, also for um, the carbon that is, um, sequestered in the ground. Um, there are so many multiple important reasons and I'm, I'm looking forward um, to um, learning more about from uh, Chris about the uh, ideas for um, uh, uh, making 
for working out the details of moving forward. Thank you. Thank you, Janet. Uh, next on my list is John Varner. I'm gonna bring John over and John, you can unmute yourself. Remember to give us your um, name and address. Uh, hi, I'm John Varner. I live at 54 Jeffrey Lane in Amherst. Um, I would like to thank uh, Chris and the planning board for expressing a lot of the concerns that I had regarding the size and specificity of the proposal. Um, I just think there's way too much in it to uh, do everything all at once everywhere. Um, and part of the problem, uh, I really applaud the social um, aspects of the program with regard to diversity and inclusivity, et cetera. But the goals around that are very uh, aspirational and not well-defined and will take years to step into effect. Uh, whereas the zoning changes that would permit expansive new development would take effect fairly immediately and the results would not be clear for several years. I, I, don't, I, I don't know how those two uh, things got united, the social aspects and the uh, developmental uh, push to, to go forward as fast as possible. Uh, one of the things that I have trouble with if, in terms of interpreting what's being proposed and uh, how it would affect the town and uh, how we can make decisions is a lack of data in the town. Um, you know, there's no way to cross-reference, for instance, um, the, I, I don't even know where to go to find information on current duplexes, triplexes, et cetera, uh, where they are. And then cross-reference that with, okay, now is that a house that's predominantly student run? Is that a, uh, or student uh, occupied? And has it had behavioral problems? The town doesn't track behavioral problems in given properties for more than a year. I mean, it's, it, we're trying to make decisions on issues where we have poor data. And that makes it very difficult to objectively look at things and decide what to do, specifically around the aquifer protection issue. Um, where do we go to get a hydrology study of the Lawrence Swamp area and how building in the Amherst Woods area would affect that? And uh, what would, you know, if we put, for, uh, you know, triplexes there, okay, so there's, you know, three dense, basically three dense occupancy units there, but there could be up to 12 cars. Okay, there's a lot of runoff and a lot of blacktop. And is that being figured into what's happening with the Lawrence Swamp Aquifer? Uh, I, I have, there's a lack of data there. It makes me very queasy to make decisions about how to handle a valuable resource like that without having uh, more to go on. Uh, but again, uh, you know, I thank everybody for uh, putting a lot on the table to discuss. I think there's too much to push through all at once. And I hope that things uh, are looked at in a very prudent and cautious way. Thanks. Thank you, John. Um, next up is Dorothy Pam. Again, name and address, please. And three minutes. Did we just lose Dorothy? I think we just did. Um, yeah. Next, next up, I have uh, Joan O'Meara. Okay. Hopefully, Dorothy, if you can hear me, come on back. There. All right. We'll get to you next, Dorothy. Joan, if you can unmute yourself. How's that? Very good. Uh, thank thank you. you. Okay. Daniel Wallach. I'm related to Joan O'Meara, 37 Cosby Avenue. I'd like to, uh, there's a project being proposed at 98 Fearing, which I believe is an example of how these new proposed regulations would affect it. At 98 Fearing, it's currently a three family uh, unit. And the proposal is to put four more units at 98 Fearing. This is a single lot. So seven units on a single lot. And uh, at present, I think it would be under the scrutiny of the zoning board as it should be. Uh, if we have these new proposed regulations, this seven unit project would go through. 
And I think th that's telling of, of, you know, we keep talking about how this is going to play out. Well, I, I think we should look at 98 fearing to see the impact of these proposed zoning changes. Thank you. Bye. Thank you very much. Um, let's go to Dorothy Pam, who is at the top of our list before um, okay. we'll bring Dorothy back over. Hi, Dorothy. Hi, hey. how are you? Uh, hey. Dorothy Pam, 229 Amity Street. Um, so uh, this is um, a lot of great ideas have been talked about. Um, I do agree that the plan presented was getting more and more complex, and um, I couldn't find any copy of the change slides in the packet, or I couldn't find, even find the packet. So that was kind of a wash there. But I think in order to achieve the goals that have been described, we have to look beyond the market, and we have to do some, kind of what's been going on at Ball Lane, which is there's going to be some people who are going to be able to buy um, some housing to be able to get into the market, but that's because there's some subsidy. And what um, I have been suggesting all along with something like Sunnyside Gardens, which was done through a, a major board, which had Eleanor Roosevelt on it and Clarence Stein, and I believe they gave the land. The land was given free. The aim was to make working uh, apartments like working man's apartments in London, uh, very small apartments, uh, houses, owner-occupied, one, two, and three families. So you could buy a house, a two-family, rent one unit, and that covers your mortgage. Um, where are we going to get that land? Well, um, Amherst College did offer a 99-year lease for a dollar to put up the DPW, but it was not a good site for a DPW because it was surrounded by some lovely owner-occupied homes. But um, a one, some kind of a um, planned community, which is what Sunnyside Gardens, now it's a historical district, but it was a planned community when I was there, could do that. And it would bring us the entry level, middle level housing that we've been, we were saying we desperately need, but I don't think the market can get it for us because of the competition with the high, high student rentals. So we cannot depend on the market. So I also want to really say thank you for all the work that's gone on. And Chris, um, I really appreciate that you and your planning staff and the building department sat down. Um, your comments, if you say you wrote them today, I could just say they were very well thought out. Clearly you've been in your mind working on this for a long time. Um, it was very helpful and it showed the deep knowledge and experience that you have in you know, working and planning in this town. It's not easy, it's not simple. Mm -hmm. um, so I just wanna say thank you for that. And I think that we can work on the goals that Mandy, Joe and Pat have brought up because we share those goals, but try to find some other way to get some subsidy, public subsidy, so that we can um, build housing that will actually be something that middle-class, working-class people can afford to buy. And, and that's my hope and suggestion. So thank you very much. Thank you, Dorothy. Um, I have Melissa Ferris again, um, if that's a legacy hand, so be it. But um, Melissa also had a partner, so there might be someone else on the call. So maybe we can bring Melissa over and verify that um, this is not Melissa speaking the second time. Yes, this is Graham Caldwell, her husband. Okay. <laughs> Thanks for uh, giving me the benefit of the doubt. Sure. <laughs> Uh, okay, yeah, so we also live at 285 Lincoln with her. Um, and uh, so, yeah, I wanted to also mention the 98 Fearing Streets project, which is a our property. Um, and it's a good example of the type of things that we are sort of afraid could be coming down the pike because of this, um, which is, it's a, it's a three unit building already that has eight cars in the garage. It's student, student rental. And the LLC that owns it out of Belstertown wants to put up um, I believe it's three units, three, um, buildings. three buildings in in the in the back. Um, that Melissa says are three units each. There are four bedrooms. Four bedrooms each. Um, and right now, all we have is the is the um, the having to go before to get a special permit to have any like neighborhood say in what's happening. And uh, it seems like what you're proposing is more of just a rubber stamp how they could just what to do. Um, which is a nightmare for us because it's already students. Um, and when it was being presented to the historic, one of the historic boards, uh, 
a, a, a few of the neighbors surrounding it who've been living there for you know decade plus with families said they would leave if that if this development came to fruition they, they would have to sell and leave and that would I, in my mind begin a cascade where the only people who wanted to buy those lots were other people who were going to develop it and rent it to students it's kind of eviscerating the neighborhood also i wanted to point out that the developer who wanted to develop it presented it as nine units because had he done 10, which he was allowed to do, one of them would have had to have been an affordable unit. So he, he there's no altruism there. Um, and it seems to me like if you want, if and I, I love the idea of getting more, you know, different incomes and, and like all sorts of different people in, in, into the town. Um, and it seems like the way to do that would be incentivizing, you know, affordable housing, not just giving like easy, giving it making it easy for developers to have less interaction with the zoning board and the public um you know maybe requiring more affordable units per whatever project they're doing or you know i, I don't i don't know the specificity of it but like that would be a real way to actually incentivize this type of thing which are profit driven um and i also just wanted to say that you know it's a this is a very sensitive ecosystem of like the students and the people who live here and taking away guardrails seems like a, a, a really potentially would, could potentially have a very bad impact um okay that's all i wanted to say thanks thank you so much um and next up we have frederick hartwell and bring frederick over and get name and address please hi fred can you unmute Okay, you're unmuted, Fred. Go ahead. We cannot hear you, Fred. So I don't know if you're having an issue with your mic, but you are unmuted and we can't hear you. And we'll give him a moment to okay. try to fix that. And we can come back to Frederick in a minute. Let's mm -hmm. move on to uh, Ira Brick, I'm going to bring Ira over. Hello, Ira. Hi, Ira Brick, 255 Strong Street. I can see where it shouldn't be a hardship to earn some rental income in your home via a duplex or ADU, both of which are already allowed. But then there's the problem that Christine pointed out tonight of an investor being able to hack into our regulations to turn it into a non-owner occupied student rental. Many people in Amher share this concern. There is an infinite demand for student housing here and a growing invasive flood of outside investors who are not at all concerned about maintaining our town's balance, livability, diversity, and attainability. I think when we discuss triplexes, we need to remember that every triplex will have at least 12 students and their guests and 12 cars and their guest cars allowed in that house, maybe one of several triplexes in that neighborhood. I've heard no discussion in this proposal about how to control the negative unintended consequences that could and probably will happen. What happens if you were to pass this proposal and then there's a buying frenzy by the many student housing investors who are already calling so many of us repeatedly. How will you control the surge of student housing in our neighborhoods? And finally, why not just install those controls now? Thank you. Thank you, Ira. And maybe we can try Fred one more time. Mm -hmm. All right, Fred, unmute yourself and let's see if we can hear you. We're not getting you no. just yet. Well, Fred, we can't hear you. Um, you may want to try our dial-up number, um, use your phone and call in. Um, we'll keep our eyes peeled for you. Um, but it doesn't seem that this connection is working for you. So 
Um, we're going to have to move on for the moment, but we'll pay attention for you. Um, Dorothy, is that a legacy hand, or do you have another comment? We'll bring Dorothy back. I, I have one sentence to add to the discussion of 98 Fearing, that the plan includes a parking lot of about 24 cars, so that all the, so all the surrounding houses will be looking into a few little buildings, but almost all the green we had disappeared and a parking lot of 24 cars. And that is so destructive of the trees, of nature, of what we want to have in neighborhoods. We want to have green space. We want to have, uh, and there's almost no space for the students to actually mingle outside either. Um, it's just the trees on other people's properties around them because their trees will have been all been cut down. So I, we, we have to really be careful that we, we try to keep a balance and um, somebody pointed out that once a house has become um, a totally um, student run house where there's no owner occupied, um, and we have examples, so this isn't, we, we don't make this up or we're not guessing. We can show you all the examples. We could take you around and show you house after house after house. Once that has happened, it's very hard for it to go back and to become a, a reasonable residence again. So it's very quick to destroy a neighborhood. It takes a long time to build up one. And this neighborhood does, is very diverse and has um, students living very well, but the prices are very high now. We all want to have more affordable housing. We all want people to be able to buy a home. And mm -hmm. as uh, Karen said, you want some, many people want their children to be able to live nearby and find that that's just almost impossible. So we share, we share so many of the goals. Uh, that Pat and Mandy J uh, Joe put forward, but it's uh, the pro the problem is is how to do it, and I think we really do have to come up with some subsidy yep. to try to save things. Thank you. I agree. Thank you, Dorothy. Um, Chris, you have your hand up. I don't know if you want to res respond to those comments in particular. I just wanted to clarify something about the 98 Fearing Street. Uh, property. I don't want to talk too much about it because it's coming before the zoning board, but the proposal is to put in um, three duplexes um, on a, a lot that already has um, a building that has three units in it. So the three duplexes would add six units. And um, just to clarify right now, um, those three duplexes would need to get approval from the Zoning Board of Appeals with a special permit. That's a discretionary permit. So the Zoning Board of Appeals can say no. The Zoning Board of Appeals can cut down the number of units. I don't want to discuss this anymore, but I just wanted to um, make that point clear. Thank you. Thank you, Chris. Um, I'd like to give Mandy, Joe, and Pat a chance, uh, Janet and Bruce, before we go on, just to respond to any of those comments, unless you have something, Janet, in particular. On that. Yeah, I, I was. I have a question for the public, so I, I wonder if this would be a good point. I could wait till later, but I, I was interested in asking the people in the RG or around the 98 Fearing Street, would they feel differently about this proposal if it was half only 50% of the units could be students or if it was all non-students like is there um is you know just trying to see how people react to those different ideas since it's a public hearing yeah i mean it, it seems as though the people are concerned about parking versus grass area the scale of buildings it seems like it's it's more than just that um, um to some degree but could we could we ask for their response? Because that you know, and I, I would actually love to look at ninety eight fearing maybe at another meeting or get a. Excuse me, I, I really don't think we should talk more about ninety eight fearing because it is coming before the zoning board of appeals, and they have to hear all this information, new and fresh, and we don't want the public commenting on that project now. I was just giving a clarification on the permitting process, so I think we better cut off that discussion about that project. Thank you. Thank you, Chris. Um, Bruce, did you have another comment in regard to? Well, I was going to say that uh, the first questioner asked, "What is the? Uh, how does the local historic district commission uh, in the historic districts fare in relation to all that Mandy, Joe, and Pat are uh, proposing?" And I was simply going to answer using that example, but I don't have to comment on the structure of it. Simply that the process brings uh, that uh, that pro brought that project to the local historic district commission and as it happens uh, Karen both Karen and I are still sit on that commission so um, 
so the, so the answer to the question, I guess, which you, is, is that really nothing changes in that regard. And, uh, and that project is in the public eye now because it came to the local historic district commission. Yeah. So the answer is that if there's any change, I mean, there is no change, but what it does actually do is mm -hmm. give one more opportunity for the public to be involved in the thoughtful process. Thanks, Chris. Um, quick, before I get to you, Andrew, um, Mandy or Pat, did you have any comments in response to the public comments? Um, I, I was going to respond to the, sort of the questions that were asked, and Bruce actually responded to one, which is the our proposal doesn't change the requirements for lots that are in the local historic mm -hmm. district. Those requirements would still stand. Um, and, and there was a question about why would we not fix the regulations and stuff before changing the zoning? Well, we're actually working as a council to fix some of that, right? Um, rental permitting regulations have been in front of the council community resources committee for about a year now. Um, and they're getting close to being referred or, or moved back towards council consideration and out of committee. Um, and that same committee is looking at the public nuisance for the same reason. And so it's it's mm -hmm. a process that is happening in some sense simultaneously, or that one was started before, uh, in some sense, before this proposal came forward. And so it's not that we're not, it's that we're doing these together in a sense, or simultaneously because the town can do stuff simultaneously it's not one or the other right thank you and andrew thanks tom um and actually mandy joe what you just uh was talking we're talking about remind me one of the quotes i saw in your presentation and i'd love to if you can maybe share the the source of that brookings report but just you know the the commentary there around assuming renters will be bad neighbors you know, I thought was really a, a very interesting piece. Uh, I'd love to be able to look at that report in more detail, uh, if you don't mind sharing the source. And then um, also I, I was um, wondering, Chris, would it be possible or if we've ever considered like inviting um, maybe uh, planning directors uh, from other communities that face some of these problems? I know Bruce has got a, a very ambitious project that he's outlined to to really do some research, reach out to folks, but wondering whether um, it might be useful to invite somebody from a community that faces similar problems for like open Q&A. Um, so um, those are my comments. Thanks. Thank you, Andrew. Um, are there any other final um, board or presenter comments? Um, don't see any. Um, Chris, we'll need your help about kind of next steps here. From what I gather, um, Mandy Joe, your objective was to get um, an endorsement from this board. Um, from what I'm hearing, that might not happen as a whole towards this today. Um, I'm wondering if we want to um, keep this open for another two weeks till the next meeting, or if we um, if you want to reconsider how, um, Andy Joe, how you'd like us to move forward, or Chris, how you'd like us to move forward. I was going to recommend that you continue this public hearing till March 15th. And Pam could probably tell me, um, give me advice about what time to recommend. Mm -hmm. We do have a historic preservation plan presentation that's coming up, but if you move this, uh, continue this to March 15th at 6. 35 and then kind of made a promise to yourself that you would talk about this for an hour and then allow the historic preservation plan people to make their presentation and maybe go back to this if you had time or maybe yeah. you'd resolve it in an hour but anyway that would be my recommendation march 15th at 6 35 okay. um mandy joe you have your hand up yeah um given what chris said tonight um we would actually request maybe two meetings from now because it will take us a little bit of time to meet with Chris um, to and the planning staff to 
to talk about what they would like to see changed. Um, as I, as we said earlier on in some of the meetings before the public hearing, we would really like to work with everyone to get something that is a positive recommendation that the planning staff can get behind. And given what she said tonight, uh, we're not sure two weeks is enough for us to not only meet with them, but also then come back with the changes, yeah. right? Um, we suspect it'll take a little longer than two weeks um, mm -hmm. to to get through all of that. Um, and so we were hoping that it might be not the next meeting, but the meeting after that. I'm not sure whether you're on the 5th or whether you're on the 29th. So that's why I don't know a date, but I'd, I'd like Chris's thoughts on that. Um, what, may I speak? Sure. Yes, please. Okay, so um, you could continue this meeting, this public hearing to the to the fifth. Um, we have reserved the March 29th date if we absolutely need it. So um, if you're willing to meet March 29th, um, that would be the fifth Wednesday of the month. Usually we reserve those for kind of emergency situations. Um, otherwise, you would go to April 5th, which I don't think we currently have anything on the um, agenda for that night. Okay, uh, Mandy Joe, does that seem reasonable to you? April fifth at six thirty-five. April fifth does feel, seem reasonable to okay. us. It does. Uh, I yeah. wonder what Janet. Yeah, I was going to come. Thank you. Janet? Thanks, Tom. Thanks, Mandy Joe. I, I wonder: is there a way that other people, like some planning board members, can also participate in sort of workshopping? I've been. I know this has been sort of a struggle for since the town council to figure out like how to work together or how to kind of take next steps together because I'd be interested in being part of that process and I think maybe other board members might want to participate or look at drafts or make suggestions. Um, just Chris, how does that complicate the process? If it, would, it would have to be a public meeting, so. Um... I guess I feel like it would be more beneficial if staff met with the proponents and talked about our concerns and then came and presented something to um, in the public and then you could have a working session as the planning board. But I think it would um, it would complicate things if you tried to have um, members of the planning board be in that working session without making it a public meeting. I, my, I would. Is it, is that depend on the number? Because I know. I mean, I've worked with you and and um, on different drafts of things, um, but I don't want to say just me. But I just think it's if it's less than a quorum, because I've done that with you and um, Ben when he was around. So, Mandy, Joe. So, it it depends on if the planning board says these two members go work, then it becomes a public body. And so it, it, it doesn't depend on quorum versus not quorum. It depends on sort of if a public body sort of assigns a subgroup to work on something, then it becomes a public body that has to follow open meeting law. Mm -hmm. um, if the planning board, if a public body assigns one person to work on something, it's not because one person is not a group. Um, so th that's that's as much as I can say. Well, I, I genially offer my services or ideas. <laughs> if, the, if the board wants to put actually say we'd like a few people to yeah. come, I think that also would be appropriate. And, and I see, Janet, there's also consideration about having another very productive working session like we've had before. And maybe there's an opportunity for Mandy Joe or others to join us in one of our um, planning sessions. So that's something that's going to be up for discussion um, possibly later today. So, and Bruce, I see your hand. Um, I was just going to say that because I know Janet's. Uh concerned about this and has uh, uh and i personally don't have any problem with uh, um the idea that a single member of the board uh, uh who's uh, i mean i've got my little project but i don't need to um i don't need any help with that i don't need to engage with anybody other than people outside of the town 
But uh, from my point of view, Janet, if you wanted to join with Mandy Joe and the planning staff, if that was agreeable to those, that uh, I would just say one person from the board who was particularly uh, in inclined, uh, why not just say, uh, why not just when it offer your offer your services to the to the to the to that that crowd and see whether they say yes. Yeah. Uh, Chris, is that possible, or does that create another open meeting issue with one person? No, I think um, we could accommodate uh, that as um, Mandy and Pat and me and Janet and. Nate and, and Rob, we could have a meeting uh, of that group. <clears throat> I think Is there without... anybody on the planning board that objects to that? I don't see any. Mr. Malloy's hand has yes, popped up. Um, Nate? Hi, thanks everyone. Yeah, I've been listening. I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm gonna caution um, about trying to make a quick fix to the zoning amendment. I think there's a lot to it and when Chris and I and other staff met, I think, you know, as we pointed out, there's a lot of unintended consequences. So, you know, I, you know, that's not saying we can work with something, we can't figure something out, but I don't want to think that we can do something in two weeks and say, now we have, an, you know, a change to the zoning amendment. I mean, I would almost recommend referring this back or something else. And then, you know, having these conversations without the time pressure of trying to come up with a fix to the zoning amendment. And so I think there's a lot of pieces to it. So some of it might be redrawing zoning districts on the ground, right? If RO and RLD permeate mm -hmm. village centers, maybe they need to become RVC or BVC. Maybe we do need to tweak uh, duplexes. Um, and you know, I like the idea of allowing them, but I think we could have design standards for duplexes to say that they need to look like single family homes in terms of massing roof lines and entries. And you know, Northampton and other communities have design guidelines like that. I just think it's, it's a lot to try to squeeze in in two weeks. Um, and so I, I just, you know, I think we can continue to work on it, but I, I just, I'm, I'm not, I don't want to promise we're going to have, you know, something that's ready to go. I, I, I feel like yeah. it, you know, some of these are pretty big things that have a lot of, a lot of pieces to it. Yeah. And, and I think that um, Chris called out several key items that are workable that Mandy Joe is interested in and Pam uh, Pattern interested in following up on. So, um, you know, maybe those three things become a focus. Maybe they're simpler to um, address in the short term. And we have longer term discussions about, as you're saying, you know, some of the implications to this as, as a whole. If that makes sense. But I think in either case, we probably want to continue this um, this hearing um, until uh, what we have as March 29th at 6.35 p.m. I think we said April, oh, April 5th. 5th. Uh, April 5th, yeah. April 5th. Yeah. Can I just say one thing? Um, I have a lot of respect for Janet, and she knows that. But at the same time, uh, I feel like I would really like the opportunity with Mandy to meet with Chris and the, the rest, uh, Nate and uh, Rob Moore without anybody else because I temporarily and then have Janet join us because I feel like there's a lot that needs to be said and it can be difficult for people to feel completely comfortable um, throwing ideas back and forth. Um, so I would like to not, that's my preference, I will go with whatever you decide as a planning board, but I would like to see Janet join us later and not initially. I agree with Pat in that statement. And I saw Bruce's hand um, in agreement with that as well. So an initial conversation with Pat, is that okay with you, Janet? And then a follow-up conversation? Okay, so that seems like a reasonable plan. Um, and we need a motion to continue this hearing to April 5th at 6.35 p.m. I see Andrew. So moved. And Bruce. I'll do what you do, Tom. I second. Excellent. So I believe we need to take a vote on this. So I will do a roll call. And I don't have a master list as um, Doug had. So I'm just going to wing this one. And we'll go with Bruce. Aye. Karen. Aye. Janet. Aye. Jo Johanna. 
Aye. And Andrew? Aye. And I am an I, so that is unanimous. And we will continue this hearing in about four to five weeks. Thank you again, Mandy, Joe, and Pat. And thank Nate you. Thank you. Feedback. Thank you, Chris and Rob and Nate. Thank you very much. Bye. All right. Um, our next agenda on the Ida on the uh, our next item on the agenda <laughs> is old business. Um, do we have any old business? I am not aware of any old business. Okay. Um, number five on the agenda is new business. We have not aware any of any new business. Um, there is there. Uh, Doug and I had spoken about possibly putting um, another working session on the table for everybody in regard to some of the, um, uh, I guess, village center districts that uh, Chris pointed out as being important and also came up today as being important. I'm not sure if that's something that um, anybody on this board would be interested in meeting on an off week um, to have a conversation about village centers. You could consider meeting on March 29th since that's already a mm -hmm. date that okay. you have reserved. Bruce? That's exactly what I was gonna suggest. Okay. Anyone else have an interest in meeting in person with a real map and talking about village centers? Um, Doug and I, great. I see everyone's thumbs up. So Doug and I uh, met via Zoom yesterday and kind of looked at um, the East Village Center, talked about some different things that were possible there just as a conversation. So um, we might come with some ideas or, or things we don't want to bring up in terms of how to start thinking about that particular area as a case study for other areas. So um, we'll try to put that on the agenda for March 29th at, shall we say seven? That was when we met last time. Does that seem reasonable for people to digest some food ahead of time? Okay, great. Um, next on the agenda, number six, form A, A and R subdivision applications. We don't have no. Wow. Um, number seven, upcoming ZBA applications. Any? Chris? No? I don't think there's any new ones that have come through the pike. I think we've told you about the new ones, yeah, that we have in hand. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, okay. Uh, number eight, upcoming SPP, SPR, and SUB applications. We do have those and my mind is blank right now. So Pam, can you remember what those are? Yeah, we, we actually talked about the um the the pavilion at the book and plow um mm -hmm. at Amherst College. That's what's coming and we expect that. We think it's going to be on the agenda on April 19th. Okay. But that's the only one that I'm aware of, Chris. You 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 spoke as if there were more than one. That's the only one I'm aware of. So that's it. Let's go with that for now. Yeah, it's just that one. And that's coming to us or that's going to? That's gonna to come to the planning board. Mm -hmm. It's, it's coming to you. It's um, a property off Southeast Street. Yeah. And uh -huh. um, they're proposing to make a pavilion there for, I believe it's for employees um, and so you'll, you'll be okay. seeing it. It's Tom Hartman and um, Hart Coldeman Hartman, C and C and H. Yep. Okay. Is it is it Southeast Street or North Pleasant? There are two different proposals. The North oh. or the East Pleasant proposal was a proposal by UMass to build a pavilion on the mm -hmm. um, Renaissance Center property. And Amherst College is proposing to build a pavilion on property that they own that's just off Southeast Street. It's up the hill. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, which has a great view, by the way. So if you ever hike up there, it's gorgeous. Mm -hmm. um, okay, and moving on, number nine in our agenda, planning board committee and liaison reports. Um, Pioneer Valley Planning Commission, Bruce, anything to share? Uh, no, no meeting, nothing to share. Okay. Um, CPAC, Andrew, anything? Nothing. 
Okay, my self and design review board. We had a meeting on Monday. Um, we approved some signage for Amherst Market, which is on Triangle Street. Um, some, I guess an update to their signs, no big changes. Um, we approved some exciting graphics for the front of the White Lion Brewery that is taking over um, where the high horse was underneath the Drake and some, some signage there, uh, which is pretty exciting to see come to life. Um, and then we approved some signage for the Spoke Live. And if you hadn't known this, the Spoke is looking to try to um, I don't know if they have permission to do this yet. Um, Chris can probably clarify, but they are taking over um, an adjacent building on that lot um, for a live, um, um, I guess, music venue, um, and then opening up the existing entire spoke building for just the bar and lounge. So that's happening, and uh, we approve that signage as well. Um, that's all I have. Um, Solar Bylaw Working Group, Janet, anything? I'm just reading our minutes to since I can never remember what we talked about. Um, so our next meeting is on Friday at 1130 and people might want to attend. It's it's the first look at the solar assessment, which is kind of um, the the consultant saying, you know, where could solar go in this very kind of giant way? And um, it's not like a granular, like, no, you can't do it here or there. But so it might be an interesting presentation for people to to watch if they're if you're interested. Um, we also worked on um, parts of the solar bylaw. Chris had drafted a thing on abandonment and decommissioning. It's a little little dull. And then um, also the um, submittal requirements, which are really quite extensive. And so that we went through that and had a lot of questions and ads and that and it's still all in these pieces. And so I, I know, I don't know if you're anxious to see it, um, but it's it's getting put together piece by piece. Um, and that's about it. Um, the the solar assessment survey is going out in the next few weeks. And so I don't know when that goes live, but I'll, I'll know on Friday probably. And then that's it. Awesome. Thank you. And what's the date for that um, next meeting with the presentation? Um, it's this Friday for we meet from a every other Friday, 11.30 to 1.30, okay. and it's Zoomed. Okay, great, thank you. And then also there was a presentation to ECAC probably today. So all, all of these are recorded, so. Okay, they'll be on the website, thank you. Uh, CRC, Chris, anything to update? So the CRC is holding a public hearing on this zoning amendment tomorrow. That starts at 4.30 in the afternoon. So you may want to tune in on that. Um, I think other than that, they've been reviewing the rental registration bylaw, which Mandy said is just about ready to go back to town council. And they are also working on a nuisance house bylaw. Okay. Thank you. Uh, number 10, we have the report of chair. I'm not the chair. He is not here. So we have no report, I would guess. Um, number 11 is report of staff, Chris. Pam, anything? Um, we think we're close to hiring someone to um, take one of our planner positions, and we're very excited about that. We hope it comes to pass, so that's good news. Congrats. And I have to thank um, Pam and Nate and also our um, permit administrator, um, Jennifer Mullins, who's not here tonight, but she, uh, the three of them have really stepped up to fill the needs of our department. We've also had two administrative staff who have been um, out with family problems. So it's been a challenge, but people have really stepped up to help out. So thank you all. Excellent. Um, and that seems to be it for the day. So um, do we need a motion to adjourn. I don't really pay attention right now. I'm usually checking out. So uh, motion to adjourn, no? <laughs> adjourn. I don't think we need a motion. You All can right. just declare declare we the declare, meeting. You we declare. have adjourned at 8.56 p.m. Um, thank you, everybody, for participating, and we'll see you in two weeks. Thank Bye. you, Tom. Bye. Bye, everyone. Thank Thanks. you, and good night. Good thank night. you, Tom. Thank you, Pam. Thanks, Chris. Bye, Bye Chris. Bye, Janet. Bye. Goodbye, everyone. And oh, I have to stop recording.